There is a chord that hangs below. These are the lines we follow. There is a chord that hangs above. The lines we draw together. A chord that flexes to the ground. These are the lines we follow. It tugs and pulls as I climb down. The lines we draw together. I see early morning rain. These are the lines we follow. When it was finally finished, her mother hung it on a line so the rain would calm the creases and the warm sun would help the seams to lie flat. Tangle of our dying words The bundles of baby The knotted thread of all we know now These are the lines we follow The push and the pull and the circle Of skin and bone and feather Constantly unravel The lines we draw together the pull and the circle of skin and bone and feather constantly unravel the lines we draw together the red dress that her mother had made her, had spent a week making, was hanging on a line in the garden. And the dance was tonight. It was ready. All day long, she'd stolen glances at the dress. It flickered red in the corner of her eye when she walked up through the garden after feeding the goats and the chickens in the early morning. And later, as she waved at her father returning to work, it seemed to be the dress that waved back then. So she lingered by the window and watched how the wind filled its skirt. It already moved like a dancer. How would it feel to finally wear it? In the early evening, 
she helped to put her brother and sisters to bed and sang to them their favorite songs. Alle meine Entchen schwimmen auf dem See, schwimmen auf dem See, Köpfchen in das Wasser, Schwänzchen in die Höhe. From the upstairs bedroom window, the dress looked alive, almost like it could walk out of the garden and down through the village all by itself. And she longed to follow it. Soon, she thought. Soon, just for a short while, I will leave the order of this house. She was 16 now a few years older than her siblings. And this gave her a unique place in that family. And she did feel caught, caught between the responsibilities of adulthood that she'd had to quickly learn and her own desire to run and spin like a child again. Are the little ones asleep? Whispered her mother from the landing. Yes, I think so, she said. And she carefully closed their bedroom door behind her. Well, here you go then. Her mother presented her with the red dress. I hope it fits. Skin and bone and feather Constantly unravel The lines we draw together with a push The pull and the circle Of skin and bone and feather Constantly unravel The lines we draw together The girl in this story is an old woman now Her name is Erna, but she's always been Orma to me. She's 89 years old now. And she lives about a mile away from that childhood home with the goats and the chickens in the garden. She lives in the next village, a slow sort of place, surrounded by grapevine hills, a quiet sort of place, just dogs barking in gated gardens, neighbors waving hello and then getting in the cars in the morning, and church bells marking the hours She lives on a long street called Eremitage of Vig, which gets its name from the ancient hermitage that lies at one end. And at the other end of Eremitage of Vig, there's a big barn, which used to smell fantastic. I think it's one of my earliest memories, standing in that big barn in the milk queue when I was five years old one hand reaching up to my orma, and the other hand proudly clutching the milk container cold against my leg. 
On either side of Eremitage are vague. There are fields that spread out to the boundaries of the village. But nothing really grows in these fields. It's just a claggy, clay-like soil, the kind that gets stuck in the tread of your shoes. In the years following the Second World War, these fields became known across the whole country. They became known as the field of misery. Number nine, Eremitage Vague, is the oldest house on that street. And it's still got its 1950s kitchen with a cold water tap. Above a massive cellar, which is constantly well stocked for any kind of emergency. And I usually visit them at Christmas time, which sounds nice, but there's also no central heating. So only one warm ish place for us to sit in while the TV blares out Schlager Musik. Germany's newly sanitized folk songs. The happy, clappy, nothing bad has ever happened here, electronic trance beats that my old grandparents cannot get enough of. When the TV's off, it's more peaceful. My Oma sits by the window and does Sudokus, and my Opa peels potatoes. My Opa basically has two hobbies. The first hobby is cleaning out the soles of shoes, and the second hobby is peeling potatoes. He cuts the skin from those vegetables so no flesh is ever wasted. And it's the quality of his attention that I notice when he does this. He is patient and steady. There's beauty in the functional, everyday task for them. A mended sock, a well-swept path, a properly peeled potato. And both my grandparents are natural storytellers, too. Or natural isn't really the right word. They are relentless storytellers. They're compulsive storytellers. And neither can hear very well these days, so when they really get into the stories, there's a lot of shouting over each other going on. And they do mention the war. They almost only talk about the war. And those stories, they tell and retell again and again and again. And like I've not heard it a hundred times before, they still say to me with urgency, Krieg ist schlecht. Krieg ist immer schlecht. When it all gets a bit loud after breakfast, sometimes I go out and walk. I walk in circles around this village. I walk some of the same paths that my grandparents have walked for over 80 years. And I nod at the familiar strangers with whom I share this place. And often when I'm walking, I've got my grandparents' voices ringing in my ears. War is shit. War is always shit.
The dress hung new and heavy as Anna left her house and walked through the village. It would be further tonight to the dance than it needed to be. She would take the long route to avoid the fields on the edge of Bretzenheim. Although the war was over, the sight of those fields reminded her that for some, the misery continued. And she didn't want to see them. She didn't want to see them tonight. Tonight was hers, finally. And there was a lightness in her step. She looked down and admired the dress. How the buttons at the top glinted in the moonlight. And the skirt seams gently patted her shins as she walked. the dress up a little to protect those new seams from the wet pavement. At the top of the main street she entered the marketplace and there she recalled how for most of her childhood this place had seemed a different colour as one by one, window by window, the new flags had appeared and punctuated this place in red and white and black. She looked to where the market stalls usually stood and then she remembered. Her father had been arguing there one day with a younger man in a dark uniform. She must have only been a small child because she hadn't fully understood back then. The younger man was angry about the flags and he was shouting at her and her father how they must hang one. They must now hang one. And she remembered how on that day her father had shouted back. We didn't want one. We wouldn't have one. And she looked up then at her father and felt a mixture of fear and pride all at the same time. And then she remembered. It must have only been a year or so after that day. She'd been walking home from school and she'd seen that new flag fluttering from the top window of their house. And she'd run into the garden and cried out jokingly, Papa! Papa! 
thought we hated that flag. And her father had hushed her then and hurried her indoors. And things began to feel different in the house after that. She remembered pressing her face against the wood of the kitchen door that night. How she'd listened to her father crying. Was it about the flag? How had everything changed so quickly? Her mother was singing less around the house. The gossip that usually rang in the grape fields had got much quieter. And her father had, in the end, gone away to fight for the very flag that she'd watched him sternly resist. He left her and her mother to hold the household together alone.
We'll miss the first dances. Jolted from her memories, Anna meets a friend in the marketplace and they walk arm in arm the rest of the way to the dance. My Oma has told me how she'd walk along the river, often a few miles to the various village dances that happen through the year. And I can picture her now, avoiding the puddles in her path, holding up her skirt, protecting her head from the wind. September. The autumn dance would be fueled by Fährerweiser, the first fizzy harvest wine, the kind that gets you a sparkling kind of drunk, the kind that'll blur the edges of any evening, anywhere. Seven hundred miles away, Fizzy wine blurs the edges for my English nana. Lipstick, curlers, glad rags. She's getting ready to walk high heeled from Gateshead into Newcastle to dance foxtrots and waltzes. She'll be out with her sister. And they'll be hoping to meet tall American soldiers. later, my nana's Newcastle dance floor becomes mine. There's a long queue outside the club, but we got here early, so already the bass thumps through my rib cage. My own edges are blurred by the third or fourth rum and coke. I like to think of us three, my Oma and my Nana and me, 
like sundials turning around each other, turning and circling, turning and circling. And from each of our turning places, we all know the beautiful ache of something essential, of something undeniable. As our feet scuff the places where everybody meets, in the dance hall's doorway, catching her breath, watching the whole room turn. When she entered, some friends came to greet her, while others just whisked past, already committed to the end of the tune. The floorboards creaked and sprang, and the walls reverberated from the sound of a band of four musicians pulsating in the corner. The dance hall was full. There was a need for dancing, a need to move together. And she moved through that evening, free and easy. Dances blurred and merged together until there was only one big circle. Everyone moving in it, the sticky, Welcome, joy of it. outside into the blue light of the early morning. Everything felt so peaceful. And then she made herself look. She made herself look across to the fields she'd avoided before. She'd overheard people talking about them at the dance. full of men from all over Germany, they'd said. And they'd called them something new. The field of misery. She squinted in the soft blue light. And through her half-closed eyes, she saw the wet grass was sparkling. A 
group of barbed wire prisons, watchtowers and mud puddles, the sky is full of birds. Beyond this forgotten mountain, this darkened island, the sky is full of birds. Although our sickness grows each day, and our sorrow breeds in each new face, the sky is full of birds. And despite our eyes which blink onto the page, the child's death and death again, the birds are high, and the sky is full of them. Above a purple lupin field, Swaying in the best sunsets of my life, the sky is full of birds. The rare metal of bird song and the clashing guns of bird song, the wailing prayers of bird song and warning sirens, bird song. The prisoners of bird song and the transport trains of bird song and the screaming hope of bird song. Oh, we are slow singers. We are slow singers.
The Allied armies didn't call it a prisoner of war camp, although that's what this was. This was an open air prison for captured German soldiers at the end of the war. And it was there from the end of the war until the end of 1948, at times containing over 100,000 men. The Americans called it a camp for disarmed enemy forces. And this meant that the human rights law on collective punishment didn't apply. And so death continued in the fields on the edge of Bretzenheim. And they were just fields then too. Inside the fence, there were no buildings or shelters of any kind. And so the prisoners that were starving sometimes drowned in the mud, too weak to pull themselves out. Or sometimes the Allied soldiers would shoot, choose to execute one of them, the enemy, the other, the foreigner, the stateless fodder of a now defeated evil regime. That would be something to write home about. For three years after the end of the war, my orpa cycled past the bodies of German prisoners, piled up on the pavement every morning on his way to school. It's the same road I take now between their house and the swimming pool, so I picture him when I walk. A 12-year-old boy cycling as fast as his legs could go. He wouldn't forget that. And maybe that was the point. Perhaps the treatment of those prisoners was all part of stamping out bad ideas for good. Or maybe it was part of the collective punishment. My opa never did forget it. This story is the one he tells me most of all. And that 12-year-old boy grew into an anxious young man, too afraid to go to any village dance. My grandparents would meet later on a factory floor rather than on a dance floor. And now, my opa is a scared old man. Partly, he's haunted by the many ghosts of this village. The prisoners, the ghost of his own father, and the many wandering ghosts of the villagers that my opa has found dead over the years lying full of cheap schnapps in their well-stocked cellars, some decades after the war, choosing poison over the pain of the question, what happened here? I think my opa's anxiousness today is also fueled by what he reads in the papers every morning. How nobody in Germany speaks German anymore. How crime is rife and he should be afraid of any new face in his street. How there just isn't room for these extra people. Have you seen Hamburg on the news? He doesn't mean to shout, but it comes out loudly. It looks like Africa. I squirm and I try to argue with him, but he doesn't hear me. 
he leans in and without wanting any answer, he asks me, why can't people just stay in the place that they're born in? Sitting on the terrace one afternoon, my Omar is singing one of the old songs she's known since she was a child. Not many people do in Germany anymore, but my Omar still sings the old songs. I suppose everything you learn when you're young stays with you. My Omar and Opa know the horrors of the past. They endlessly recount the horrors of the past. And yet, even for them, on some days, the past seems great again. We look down into the bottom of the garden and watch Orpa working away on the sole of a trainer. Trainers are especially satisfying for him, by the way. The more complex the tread, the better. He takes his time over it. He levers out the little stones and scrapes the dried on mud from the tread. He's got a special hand tool just for that job. He leans over the garden wall and gives the soles a final brush before lining them up back in their proper place. There is a museum in Bretzenheim all about the field of misery. You have to make an appointment to go. We haven't done that yet. There's a bright yellow star on the horizon. There's a bright yellow star in the night sky. And for all the dust, its guiding light is fading. on the mountain Big blue clouds are gathering And that distant storm is sure to come But the heart that knows the color of love is pounding We better make We better make some room. 
the dark at you tomorrow. There's a bright yellow star on that young man's jacket. There's a bright yellow star on that young man. Underneath the street lights, his face is like the first flower of the springtime. We better make some room for sorrow, or we will sing the dark at you tomorrow. We better. Dark at you tomorrow. Leaving the dance, Anna started to walk towards home, leaning on her friends. How quickly the dress had lost its new feeling. She saw it was christened now with wine and sweat, and there was dust around the hem, and it felt part of her. The tunes from the dance were still ringing in her ears as they trudged dreamily along. And she savoured the carefree feeling of that morning, which was already slipping away. Passing the river again, she remembered a hot summer's day there once, teaching her brother and sisters how to swim. And she felt proud in that moment. They'd made some fun in those 12 shit years. She rested a while on the riverbank. And it occurred to her there, her littlest sister wouldn't remember those years. And she was glad of that. But she also knew that one day she would tell them, the littlest ones, how it was, how it had been, how everything had changed, not quickly, how everything had changed slowly, how their life had changed bit by bit until it was unrecognizable. How they'd all become so afraid of each other. Stop talking over the garden fence. How slowly there became new names for things. New names for people. And how she'd been punished at school when she asked one too many questions. And then... Well, she wouldn't leave out the horror when she told them, she thought. But she would also tell them how people had gone on living, too.
When hate came marching into by two time and all the neighbors started talking well there was nothing to do then but cherish the evening shooting waltzes into dancing halls and our reflections as clouds of fire light up the sky and all the children at home are sleeping while we are dancing the long walk home She would tell the little ones how their mother had crept out during the night to take lumps of butter to their neighbor when he wasn't allowed to go to the shops anymore. And she would tell them how they had still sung the old songs from time to time inside the house. And she would tell them about the day when the war was finally over, when the women of the village had helped each other to tear down those flags, and they were gone, and that was over. And she would tell them about the day a long time after that, when she'd come home from school to find their father had returned. Yes, they had suffered, but they had survived. They could now try to mend and try to heal. And by the wall, there's a little girl standing. She was you once with all of her questions and all of her questions make the wall look smaller. Don't be nervous, little girl. You are the answer. Pulling her house key from one of the deep pockets of the dress, Anna said goodbye to her friends and walked up the path to her house alone. It was still early. The house was still sleeping. She opened the door quietly slid off her shoes and then glided around on the tiles in the hallway. 
her body was still full of the dance. And this whole place would feel different once the day began. So she couldn't resist dancing a few last waltz steps in the kitchen. Tiny steps, giddy and almost falling over, until suddenly she stopped and stared at the kitchen table, which was lit in a familiar light. And she remembered the last time she'd been down here before dawn. It had only been a week ago. She'd come down into the kitchen unable to sleep. And there it had been, spread out in red and white and black on the kitchen table. Her eyes had darted then between the flag and her mother's face, sitting there in the half-darkness, alarmed at the interruption. And she'd looked then to her mother's hands and seen the scissors glinting in the candlelight. It was going to be a surprise, her mother whispered, and beckoned her daughter to the table to help. In silence then, Anna watched her mother attend to that flag with care and precision. She watched her mother's hands carefully unpick the thread that held those thick black lines in place. And when the black came away from the white, she watched her mother hold the familiar angular shape up to the candlelight before throwing it in the stove to burn. And next, as she helped to hold the cloth steady, Erna watched her mother cut around slowly in a big circle until the white from the middle came away. After folding this piece up, putting it in her sewing box, Anna's mother divided the remaining red cloth up into sections and marked them with chalk. to bed now, love, her mother said. I'll finish this another day. I'll finish it in time for the dance. After working for a week on the red dress, when it was finally finished, her mother hung it on a line in the garden so the rain would calm the creases sun would help the seams to lie flat. I will.
spinning like planets, orbiting the universe of muscle and tendril, the flicker of your bones under my hand. I can meet you in memory when a human choreography pulls us all into a time. story still ringing in my ears, I walk. I walk in circles around this village. I walk some of the same paths that my grandparents have walked for over 80 years. And I nod at the familiar strangers with whom I share this place. The glassy-eyed old men moving up and down Eremitage Vague on rusty bicycles loaded with schnapps. And I think about my Oma and Opa about now. They'll be in their living room with the TV on, watching the news, shaking their heads, and then turning it up really loud when the happy Schlager songs come on. 
and I see this village and all its ghosts. Where the birds still circle the grapevine hills and the river still runs between tall trees. And I feel this land spread out around and underneath me. This land my father left, laden with its unspeakable sorrows. In this continent of turbulence, of fighting, and of dancing. In this hemisphere of the darkest winters and the lightest summer nights. In this world of unfathomable lives. I think I'll always be able to conjure up my grandparents' voices, their relentless stories, their endlessly repeated lines. And just as their memories of the past don't protect them, our knowledge of the past doesn't protect us. Lives can and do repeat. But there are so many ways to move in a circle. Hush, don't sing. You can't sing those songs anymore. Though you sing of green and pleasant land They burned the evidence And the arguments for joy In case we forget again That we were born to kill for love Which is not real love but it's warming the cold evening And the others went before us Collecting sticks from the woods To feed the flames That will suck the air from around us We will drown before the thunder comes We'll go outside and build a fire Piling it higher and higher And as we watch it all burn The sun will go The ground will blacken where an old wind blows And we'll be here in the same old place With smoke in our hair And soot on our faces Love Oh, careless, careless, careless We are blinded by the pull of one side on the other side And it tugs at our skin and we let it in Just to keep peace with the neighbours, just to quieten the din though I will follow you outside and we'll build a fire gardens and pile it higher and higher and as we watch it all burn the sun will go the ground will blacken where an old wind blows and we'll be here in the same old place with blood on our hands and guilty faces 
and the oldest excuse is love. Oh, careless, careless, careless love. Oh, it always starts slow. The promise of belonging, the promise of belonging, the promise of belonging can drown us in its shivering skin. If to be loved, we all stop talking. Hush, hush, don't sing. can't sing those songs anymore, Grandmother, though you sing of green and pleasant land, they've been covered over in the falsest of colour, from the smoke of a fire, which still hangs above us. Push and the pull, circle of skin and bone feather. These are the lines that we are following. These are the lines we draw together. Push and the pull and the circle of skin and bone and feather. These are the lines that we are following. These are the lines we draw together. Push. Back at number nine, Eremitage of Egg. It's mid afternoon and the house is snoozing. The TV is off. And my grandparents are on their respective sofas. My opa snoring gently. And the cat is curled at my oma's feet. My shoes are muddy, so I take them off in the hallway 
and carry them carefully through the house. Quietly, I open the back door and leave them just outside. So my opa can clean the soles when he wakes up. <laughs> <laughs>